We're walking through kind of slowly through the book of Philippians, and um, it's just an amazing, amazing book, and I, I know um, I'm not doing it justice, but we're walking through verse by verse and just trying to grab a hold of some new stuff that God has for us right, right from his word. Um, it's, uh, it's a book of joy. It's a book uh, regarding Victoria Christian living. It's a book that Paul writes. He's in prison. He's in a prison cell, and he's writing this book back to the church at Philippi, and he's encouraging them, and he's uh, just um, giving them uh, a lot of good stuff that's going to help them be all that they need to be for the cause. And um, today we're going to finish up chapter 3. Um, yeah, chapter 3, verses uh, 20, uh, 12 through 21. And um, you know what? There's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a possibility of having joy no matter what. Okay? There's a possibility. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's possible through Christ. And I mentioned earlier when we were having the technical problems with the computer, you know, how many of you get stressed a little bit and how many get stressed a lot and, and various hands went up and... and um, you know, and that just represents our personalities. That represents kind of who we are and how we're wired. Um, some of them might have something to do with maybe the way we were raised. Um, but, um, you know, God's the one that's created us, and he knows exactly all that's going on with every single one of us. So he knows how you think, he knows how I think, and yet he can bring this book to us that was written many, many years ago, and it applies to our lives today, today. So we want to make it practical. We want to make it very relevant as to where we're living today. Now, students of the New Testament, I mean, they agree that Paul must have really been at least um, interested in sports. Um, and, you know, maybe, um, it was, um, maybe he was a, a big sports fan. I don't know. A lot of people are. Some people are not. Uh, some people, uh, you know, it's, um, it kind of dictates what they are or, or defines who they are. And I'm not going to say Paul was that kind of person, obviously. But um, uh, there are so many things that we read from his writings of the books that he wrote here in the New Testament that deal with, he speaks of wrestling, boxing, running, winning the race, winning the prize, winning the crown, and he talks about discipline that's necessary um, and the danger of being disqualified. So all those things he has mentioned through his writings. So scholars of the New Testament, they're, they're pretty convinced that he was, um, he was interested in, in that sports arena. And we have kind of one of, uh, I think, one of the hallmark verses of his that would maybe define him a little bit in 2 Timothy Chapter 4 and verse 7, let me just read it real quick. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And um, so that first, uh, first phrase comes uh, from boxing, and that second phrase comes from running. So anyway, um, that's probably a little bit of, 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 of some of his background regarding um, with his alignment with, with, the, uh, with the sports world and the sports arena. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to just... Um, dig into this, but before we do, I want to just make a couple, a couple statements to start with. In our Christian life that we're, we're in, okay, we're in a race, we're in a, we're in a war, we're in a battle, we're in, we're in a Christian walk, we're on a journey, uh, and the Christian life is a journey. Um, we don't just say one prayer, then we've arrived, and do nothing else, and then expect to be in heaven one of these days. The Christian life is a journey, and it's, it's an exciting journey. Uh, and uh, there are some ups and downs, and there are some good days, and there are some bad and sad days, but it's, it's part of life, and it's part of the journey. But I think if we're not careful, we can see people that maybe start off in their Christian life with a big bang, and I think we've seen that, and I, I, I enjoy seeing people whose lives are radically changed, and they used to be this way and walk this road and live this kind of life, but their lives were changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they turned from being that way to being this way. 
That, that's tremendous. And that's the way I think our Christian life is. Uh, 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 that's one way we can describe it. But I think the danger could be this. It's not so much how we start. It's how we finish. It's how we finish. It's those that are going to endure. It's those that are going to fight the good fight of faith. It's those that are going to hang in there when it gets tough. It's those that are going to keep Christ first in their life when all the other things are pulling the other direction. It's those that endure and it's those that uh, maintain that Christian walk and that godly walk all through their life. And um, I think that's, that's so important. Someone said... Um, a lot, of, a lot of Christians are a mile wide and only an inch deep. Well, I don't want that to be us, all right? And I think Paul was deep, okay? And his writings are deep, and we're going to read those. And it's going to help us to live that life that's more deep than wide. So if you have your little sermon section there, as I think most of you do, we have four little points this morning, four little points. <laughs> And uh, these are basically, these are some principles that Paul lays down, and there's so much more here, but I'm going to just pull these out. These are four principles that Paul really just kind of describes to us for winning the prize when life is over. This is how we're going to win that prize when life is over. So in verses 12, 13, and 14, he talks about our direction. And so I'm going to say, we need to maybe check our direction, we that are serving Christ, we that are on this journey of life, okay, we need to maybe check our direction to kind of maybe find out just where we are. And he does that for us, and we're just going to read through here. And again, I appreciate how they're putting the scriptures right here. Uh, this is the NLT, and they're also on the, on the screen. But I'm going to read through this, and we're just going to take some time and see what Paul says. He says, um, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection. So let's stop right there. One of the very first things he says at the outset here, he admits and he gets very transparent regarding where he's at. Now, we're, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. This one, there was no greater person that lived since the life of Christ than Paul, okay? He wrote more of the New Testament than not, okay? So here he is. He says, I, I haven't reached it yet, okay? I'm not telling you I've arrived. Have you ever met people that think they've arrived spiritually? Oh, the Word of God says, you take heed lest you fall. So here, here, here he, just, he admits right up front that that's not who he is. But here's what he says. But I do this. He says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So he's talking about how his life in Christ, he is pressing on. In other words, he is moving. Someone said this years ago, if you're standing still spiritually, you're going backward. Because there's no standing still in serving God. And there's something about how the Spirit of God, the power of God, the love of God, the, the, the passion of God can grab a hold of us where we want to continue to move forward in our spiritual walk. He says, I press on. I press on. And then he said, no, dear brothers or sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. So we see here that Paul is kind of giving us his direction. He hasn't arrived. He hasn't achieved it all. He hasn't got it all figured out yet. But one thing he illustrates to us in this passage is the direction. And you know what? I think maybe, I just think maybe from time to time, we need to check our direction and just maybe do a self-evaluation, a self-soul-searching, 
and just find out, you know, am I really headed the right direction or is so many other things just distracting me? I kind of know where I'm headed, but, but yeah, I've been distracted. I went that detour and I went on that side road and I, I've done all these other things. And I'm thinking Paul is saying to us, you know what? Check your direction. Just kind of find out where you are. Just kind of find out what is going on. And so he's not, he's not trying to think, he's not giving us any impression that he has it right. But he is also saying, I know my direction. He said, this one thing I do. I'm going to pull that phrase out just for a little bit. This one thing I do. I think so many times we are finding ourselves doing so many things and trying to be so many things and all things to all people. And we find ourselves, ah, Paul says, this one thing I do. I think a great artist, I think they would say this one thing I do. I think a gifted teacher says this one thing I do. A champion athlete would say this one thing I do. A single parent raising her child is saying right now the most important thing is one thing I do. A student who wants to graduate with honors is saying, you know what? This one thing I do. And I think in this case here, Paul is saying, you know what? My goal is heaven. Jesus Christ is all in all to me. And I know this. I'm going to forget the past and this one thing I do. He knew where he was headed. He had his direction. He had his sail headed the right direction. And he knew what was going to happen with his life as he continued to be that person with that one goal in mind. And that was to be all that he could be for Christ and to attain that place called heaven. Dr. David Livingston, a pioneer medical missionary of of years, years past to Africa, when he returned uh, to Great Britain, he was asked, now where do you go from here? Now where are you going to go? And his answer immediately was this, I am ready to go anywhere providing it is forward. And my question is, where do we go from here? I think Paul would say, let's go forward. Let's go forward. Let's check our direction. Let's check our direction. Okay, number two. He puts himself out there, not on a limb, but this is very bold, but yet I know the context is perfect and it's going to help us. We must follow faithful leaders. And Paul was that faithful leader, and he was that one that... um, put himself out there to the point where he said, follow my example. Let's pick up with verse 15. Let all who are spiritual or spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. Verse 16. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. I've got the underlined. We must hold on to the progress we have already made. That's a great phrase. If you're trying to accomplish something, and, 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 and as, I, as I see that, if you're trying to, to get something loose and pried loose, and you've got to really pry and get this thing separated, and then you put, a, you put a bar there to keep that separation, and then you get another bite down here to make that separation larger until you have it opened the way you want it. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to lose the progress that you already have made. He said, let's hold on to the progress that we have already made Then verse 17, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. So Paul, it puts himself out there and he says, okay, I'm okay for you to pattern your life after mine. Now, I know right now this morning there are some of you, and I know some of you pretty well, you know, well, the last thing I want anybody to do is, you know, look the way I'm in the doing. I don't have it all together neither, and I don't want anybody to, to mess up like I've messed up. Well, we can all probably say that at one point, right? But now let's look at our Christian life in Christ. Let's look at what Paul is saying. Let's look where he's at, in, you know, where we need to follow faithful leaders. I believe that Paul is kind of saying to us, you know what? I've been through some things. I've learned a lot of things. And uh, my experience has brought me to where I'm at. 
And I wasn't able to always say this to you, but I am today. I'm able to tell you and, and, and give you permission to follow my example. And as, I, and as I read that and as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? There's two questions I have. And the first question would be basically, uh, who are you following? Who are you following? Is there somebody in your life that you're looking up to? Who is that that maybe you are following? And, um, you know, as we were younger, maybe we were able to say, well, you know, uh, we're following my mom or my dad, and we want to do exactly what they did. And matter of fact, if your dad was doing something, you would do exactly what he was doing. And all of us have experienced those things in our younger life. But I'm thinking as we grow older, then I think as we grow in our Christian life, who are you following? And I know we read of great authors, and there's, God has blessed our generation like he has many other generations with great people who, who have been influential in, in the church and church growth and family life and finances and all of these things that are very, very important in our Christian walk. And I'm sure there were some of you would say, you know what, uh, in my finances, I'm going to follow that person. Or, or in, my, in my relationships, I'm going to follow in the steps of that person. So who are, who, who are those people that maybe, that maybe you are following? And then there's one more question. Who's following you? Who would it be maybe near you or maybe afar off from you? But they're following you right now, and you don't even know it. Let me just go through this list just very, very quickly. Right now, someone is following you. Right now, someone looks to you to show them the way. Right now, someone prays because they heard you pray. Right now, someone is watching your fight and watching you fight your personal battles. Right now, someone wants to be like you. Right now, someone is cheering you on. Right now, someone sees Christ in your life. Right now, someone admires your strengths. And they're looking at you right now. Right now, someone is borrowing your faith because they have none. Right now, someone believes you are the best Christian they know. Right now, someone is hanging tough because you are standing tall. Right now, someone is smiling when they think of you. Right now, someone is thanking God for your friendship. Right now, someone cares that you make the right choices. Yes, right now, right now, someone is following you. Wow. When we really think about that, I think it helps us to get, to get in perspective what Paul is telling us. Let's be who God wants us to be. Follow faithful leaders. Number three. In verses 18, 19, he says, know your enemies. Now, I'm not going to land here very long, but he says, know your enemies. And before I even read this, I'm convinced he's talking about those. Are you ready? He's talking about those inside the church. Yeah. He wouldn't be talking about those that are outside the church like this. Here's what he says, verse 18. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many who conduct, whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. 
So, I'm going to say this real quickly. Know your enemies. Everybody is not in your camp. Everybody doesn't want you to succeed spiritually. Everybody doesn't want you to go and grow in your faith. Everybody doesn't want you to be a good husband or a good wife. Everybody doesn't want you to be a good kid. Everybody doesn't want you to be a good parent. And there are people that are in this world. And it's even a shame to even think about it. But in Paul's writing to them, there was a problem at the Church of Philippi where there were people in the church that was trying to cause deceptive things to take place in the lives of those followers of Christ. And Paul said, just know who your enemies are. You know what? I think it's called maybe uh, having a little bit of um, an intuition or maybe having a little bit of, 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 of um, uh, discernment. I think God can give us that discernment that we need um, throughout the various parts of life. So Paul just quickly says, maybe he didn't say it quickly, but I'm going to move on to the next point. He said, just know who your enemies are. And we know this. The enemy of the soul, Satan himself, he doesn't care how to destroy you or your family or the church of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, know your enemies. And then number four, he said, remember your true identity. And I like the way he climaxes this third chapter with these next verses. Um, We are verse uh, 20 and 21. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So I think here's the deal. Paul is saying, you know what? I want to talk to you one more time about perspective. And I know we talked about this here a few weeks ago, but it's, it, you, know, you already forgot it, so, and I did too. I'm just going to remind myself to remind you. Perspective is huge. And there's so many times, because of all that is involved in life and living and getting and gaining and moving and doing, if we're not careful as brothers and sisters, as the body of Christ, if we're not careful, we can forget that we don't belong here. We don't belong here. We're just passing through. Okay? We're here for a little while. And, um, you know, I used to think 90 years was a long time. But, boy, the older I get, I think they should raise that, don't you? About 110, 120 maybe. (laughs) You know, when Dad says, I just can't believe I'm this old. I said, Dad, I can't believe you are either. (laughs) And then he says, I'm surrounded by old people. And he's talking about his kids. <laughs> and I'd be one of those. But you know what? This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. We are. And we can love life. I think we should. God's placed us here. I don't think we should be deadbeats and, and just uh, our heads in the sand and have no energy and no excitement and no goals and no ambition. No, 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 no. Oh, God forbid. I think we need to be alive. And if we're in Christ, we are alive. And there's a lot to do. Matter of fact, there's a scripture that says, occupy till I come. In other words, just because I'm coming back and maybe it's soon, maybe it's before, you know, the, the calendar ch- turns uh, to the next year. But he says, occupy till I come. Don't just sit around. And there are some people, I think, within the church, well, the Lord's coming back soon. And they get up every morning and they have no goals and no ambition and they're not doing anything wrong. You know, they're not cussing anybody out or, or they're not doing anything wrong, but they're just 
the, you know, the Lord's coming back soon, and I'm, I'm wanting him to come back. Well, you know what? He's going to come back. It's going to happen. But I think until then, there's something for all of us to do. But we need to remember, in the middle of all that we're doing, to remember that this world is not our home. Okay? We belong someplace else. We belong someplace else. When you get a passport and you travel to other countries and they look at that passport and they look at it and they say, oh, oh, you're, oh, you're not from, no, no. Oh, you're from the United States. Yeah. You're an American. Yes. That's where I'm from. Well, you know what? <clears throat> this is not our dwelling place. We're a citizen of heaven, and we're just visiting here for a little while. We're just in this other country. We're in this other, here we are on earth for a little bit. Paul says, remember your true identity. And I think we can do that this morning. So, four little points. Check your direction. Follow faithful leaders. Know your enemies. And remember your true identity. That's just a little, little summation of those few verses where there's so much more there that Paul gives us. But I think that will help us. It will help us with our perspective and with where we are in life today.